Uh, welcome to the next iteration of Science in the Caves. Um, the next person up is Harvey Deshane. Um, and Harvey, do you want to try sharing your screen while I introduce you? Uh, I met Harvey during Lech Expeditions and some CRF stuff. He's one of those awesome caving scientists that you can ask anything of, and he never makes you feel stupid. Um, he has a delightful sense of humor. He's been uh, he fell in love with the caves of Guadalupe's when he first visited Carlsbad back in 1952, when he was a mere child of eight. Um, that fascination left him to a career in geology. Um, he is a retired petroleum geologist with degrees from the University of New Mexico, both a bachelor's and master's. Um, he's done a lot of work in New Mexico and um, Personally, has made 45 multiple day trips into Lechuguilla. Um, well, he was uh, the principal investigator for the Lechuguilla Mineral Inventory Project. Um, he's done quite a few other things. And um, with that, Harvey, I will pass it off to you. In the early 1960s, when I was a very young geology student at the University of New Mexico, I belong to San Diego Grotto. Members of the club made many trips to the Guadalupe Mountains to visit known caves and to explore the rugged canyons in search of others. We didn't understand how the caves were formed, but we did recognize that they were all remnants of much larger caves and had been truncated and exposed by erosion. I remember sitting around the campfire, talking with friends about the Grand Master Cave that had to lie beneath the Guadalupes and dreamed of finding it. It was the cave that would dwarf Carlsbad Cavern and seemingly go on forever. Little did we know. The uppermost part of Lechuguilla Cave has been known since at least 1914, when the Ogle brothers and a man named C. Whitmore filed a placer mining claim over a small cave about four miles northwest of the Bat Cave, now known as Carlsbad Cavern. Guano was a saleable commodity in those days, and entrepreneurs were constantly looking for ways to make money. The cave was developed as a guano mine, but it was too small to be economically viable and was soon abandoned. In 1930, when Carlsbad Caverns National Monument was elevated to national park status, the expanded area included the insignificant guano mine. Rangers occasionally went to the cave to make sure the guano mining artifacts were still there. In the 1950s, members of the Colorado Grotto mapped the cave and prepared a report. They noticed a tremendous amount of wind that sometimes blew through the breakdown at the bottom of the 90-foot pit. Some suggested that the cave should be called Misery Hole because of the large amount of dust carried by that wind. This map shows the known extent of Lechuguilla prior to 1986. Several attempts were made to dig through the breakdown at the bottom of the entrance, but it wasn't until 1986 that a new generation of cavers from Colorado succeeded in finding their way into the rest of Lechuguilla. When the diggers broke through, they found walking passage headed eastward and downward. They quickly mapped more than 3,000 feet of passage to a depth greater than 690 feet. They stopped where the entrance passage encountered a major cross passage, now known as the Rift. Now, 34 years later, the known limits of the cave exceed 150 miles. Because of its beauty, complexity, and mode of origin, it's known as one of the greatest caves in the world and has been called the Jewel of the Underground. In the early 1970s, Carol Hill, Dave Yagno, and I were graduate students at the University of New Mexico. We participated in caving trips to the Guadalupes and to Carlsbad Caverns National Park with Donald Davis and Michael Queen. And during evenings around the dinner table in the CRF hut, spirited discussions on the origin of Guadalupe caves would occasionally erupt. Each of us had his or her own take on how the caves were formed 
but it was not until several years later that it was realized that each was right in his or her own way. The steadying influences on the group were Carol Hill and Donald Davis. Carol's methodical approach to the study of Carlsbad Cavern brought the ideas together into one comprehensive theory on sulfuric acid speleogenesis. Donald, with his extraordinary powers of observation, keen intellect, and rational, well-thought ideas, kept us on track. The fifth person on the list of pioneers is Stephen Egemeyer, who did his PhD dissertation on the Cane Caves, an active sulfuric acid system in Wyoming. He did this in the early 1970s. Stephen visited Carlsbad Cavern and submitted a report pointing out the similarities between what he saw at Cane Cave and Carlsbad Cavern. Egemeyer's observations about Carlsbad were published posthumously with the help of Art Palmer. In 1986, when the breakthrough occurred, Ron Kerbel was the cave specialist at Carlsbad Caverns National Park. He soon realized that in Lechuguilla, he indeed had a tiger by the tail. Ron and his successors established caving protocols that changed the way cave exploration is done to this day. Ron was succeeded in 1991 by Dale Pate, who worked at Carlsbad Caverns for 21 years and was tasked with making order out of the chaos that surrounded the early Lechuguilla Cave Project expeditions. Ron and Dale made it clear that it was the Park Service, not the cavers, that was in charge of exploration in Lechuguilla. The Park Service philosophy was to take care of the cave, emphasizing cartography and science. Ron, Dale, and their successors, Paul Berger, Stan Allison, Rod Horrocks and others in the Cave Resources Office carried on that tradition. At some point after Carlsbad Caverns National Park was expanded, Misery Hole became known as Lechuguilla Cave. It was named after Lechuguilla Canyon where the entrance lies. The first formal geologic study was made by Dave Yagno, who in 1973 carefully mapped the known parts of the cave and the stratigraphic layers that enclose it as part of his master's thesis. Dave recognized that the entrance was in the Yates Formation on a geologic flexure oriented parallel to the length of the Guadalupe Mountains. He also recognized that Lechuguilla and other Guadalupe caves were formed by sulfuric acid, suggesting that the oxidation of pyrite, which is common in the local limestone, was the source of the acid. When the breakthrough happened, Ron Kerbo immediately recognized that something very significant had been found. He temporarily put a hold on exploration until the National Park Service could assess the discovery and make a plan for further exploration. The National Speleological Society held its annual convention in Tularosa, New Mexico that year, and toward the end of the meeting, Kerbo quietly asked several geologists if they would come to the park and look at what had been found. Their instructions were to look at the geology, but not go beyond the last survey point. That group included Art and Peg Palmer, Carolyn Allen Hill, Donald Davis, David Yagno, Michael Queen, and me. All of the members of the team were asked to provide a description of what they saw and to speculate on the potential size of the discovery. All agreed that the cave extended through the Yates and Seven Rivers formations and into the top of the underlying Queen. They were awed by the 150-foot drop at Boulder Falls and amazed by the massive deposit of gypsum in Glacier Bay. They also agreed that the potential for finding a really large cave was excellent, but none envisioned the grand and spectacular the cave that Lechuguilla turned out to be. Once the cave was open for exploration, its known size grew at an unbelievably rapid rate. Cavers by the dozens participated in exploration and among them was a USGS geologist by the name of Kim Cunningham. Kim immediately recognized the geological importance of the cave, and he was able to bring the laboratory resources of the USGS into play. He recognized that Lechuguilla was an unprecedented opportunity to make scientific observations and implemented science studies in parallel with exploration. Kim discovered that there are bacteria in the corroded bedrock and suggested that they are chemolithotrophs, 
a diverse group of microbes that metabolize inorganic compounds like hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide, and reduced metals. Mapping the concentration of radon gas led to the identification of microclimates within Lechuguilla, and the results were published in a paper with co-author Ed LaRock. Kim and his colleagues published early papers on the extensive sulfur deposits and investigated the fluffy chestnut brown corrosion residues that coat the surfaces of many passages. In response to the threat posed by the drilling of oil and gas wells near Lechuguilla, Kim devised and executed a huge experiment involving the time-coordinated release of helium inside the cave. He worked with Dave Yogno to map surface liniments and then stationed cavers with helium sensors throughout the cave and at surface liniments and blowholes to determine how fast and how far the gas traveled. The experiment helped establish a 6,400-acre buffer zone where oil and glass leasing is no longer allowed along the north side of the park. Kim involved cave scientists in projects to study water chemistry, microbiology, paleontology, and conceived the idea of a mineral and a geological inventory project. Kim involved specialists from outside the caving community, including biologist Larry Mallory, exobiologist Penny Boston, and NASA extreme environment expert Chris McKay. Kim's last project was a study of how regional geologic history impacted the development of Lechuguilla and other caves in the Guadalupe Mountains. I worked with him because of my knowledge of the geology of the Permian Basin. We pulled together data about paleobotany, paleohydrology, petroleum geology, and plate tectonics to cobble together a story about the geologic history of the region over the last 35 million years. This slide is the essence of the tale. The cross sections run west to east across the length of the Guadalupes, and the upper section shows how things looked 35 million years ago. Back then, there was a strong, confined hydrodynamic system where water moved down slope through the Capitan Aquifer. Over the ensuing 35 million years, the North American plate rode over the Pacific plate causing the western part of the continent to rise and stretch, creating the basin and range topography that characterizes western New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Nevada, and California. The stretching pulled apart central New Mexico, forming a collapsed elongate series of basins known as the Rio Grande Rift, shown on the lower version of the cross section. As the rift opened, it fragmented the western part of the catchment area that fed fresh water into the Capitan Aquifer. As the Guadalupes were exhumed by erosion, the water table fell below all but the easternmost part of the Guadalupes, and sulfuric acid speleogenesis ceased. Donald G. Davis is Mr. Lechuguilla. He's the consummate combination of explorer, scientist, observer, and communicator. Before the rest of Lechuguilla was discovered, he connected cave origins in the Guadalupes to petroleum deposits and hydrogen sulfide from the Delaware Basin. He has seen as much of Lechuguilla as anyone and more than most. He recognized that many speleogenetic features like relincarin and acid pool basins were caused by sulfuric acid dissolution. He also recognized that some speleothems are nucleated around bacterial filaments, such as rusticles, euloops, and webulites. He described unique speleogenetic features like acid pool basins and many others that result from sulfuric acid speleogenesis. Donald has distinctive writing and speaking styles that enable him to convey his observations and interpretations clearly and concisely. He once said of Lechuguilla that this is the cave I've been looking for, cryptic, huge. He wrote many papers describing spectacular discoveries as they were happening. His descriptive accounts of exploration and discovery are priceless contributions to the history and science of Lechuguilla. When talking about Art and Peg Palmer's geological studies in Lechuguilla, I don't have any idea where to begin. Their contributions to cave science are legendary and encyclopedic, and they have contributed much to our understanding of Lechuguilla. 
They are unmatched as a team and bring a vast background in the speleology of all types of carbonate caves. Peg is an expert in the microscopic study of carbonates and uses that skill to look in depth at rocks that have been altered during speleogenesis. She and Art are also superb editors who have turned many rough manuscripts into readable and coherent publications. They advanced our understanding of the geochemistry of sulfuric acid cave systems by documenting rising pathways that delivered hydrogen sulfide to the water table. There it was oxidized to the sulfuric acid that dissolved the immense galleries and passages of Lechuguilla. They recognized and categorized the ramiform cave passages that are characteristic of Guadalupe Mountain Caves, especially Lechuguilla and Carlsbad. They brought with them their knowledge of chemistry and hydrology and kept the rest of us honest. When they brought their considerable skill sets to bear on the speleogenetic questions posed by Lechuguilla and the Guadalupes, the result was an impressive array of publications that amplify and enhance our understanding of these remarkable caves. One of the most important contributions to understanding speleogenesis in the Guadalupe Mountains was Victor Pollock's discovery that alienite crystals can be age dated. Alienite and natrialienite are potassium sulfate minerals that form during sulfuric acid speleogenetic events in Guadalupe caves. Victor found the microscopic crystals within deposits of endolite clay in Lechuguilla and other caves, and using the potassium argon method was able to determine the timing of sulfuric acid speleogenetic events across the Guadalupes. This discovery allowed the timing of Guadalupe speleogenesis to be integrated into the regional geologic framework. Victor and Paula Provencio worked with Cindy Mosh and others to identify Tiamanite and Metatiamanite in several Guadalupe caves, including Lechuguilla. Victor is also involved with studying and age dating speleothems to unlock what they can tell us about past climate conditions. In a way, Ed Larocque epitomizes the geologic scientist who work in Lechuguilla. He was a big part of the early exploration push and helped Kim Cunningham with radon and helium studies, as well as studies of biokarst. He collaborated with Cunningham on a number of important projects and was always there to discuss ideas as they arose. Ed was an important early contributor to our knowledge of the geology of Lechuguilla Cave. This vignette recognizes the SLIME team, a group of geoscientists and geomicrobiologists who are unraveling the connections between biological and geological processes in caves. Kim Cunningham recognized that corrosion residues are caused by chemolithotrophic microbes that metabolize sulfur compounds, petroleum, and metals like iron and manganese. Kim worked with Diana Northup, Penny Boston, Mike Spildy and Eric Husser, who comprise a big part of the SLIME team. SLIME stands for Subsurface Life in Mineral Environments. Spildy, Boston, Northup, and Cooser figured out that the development of corrosion residues is similar to the process that forms soils. They gave a new descriptive name to the residues, calling them speleosols, a term that recognizes their soil-like origin. The slime team focused on microbes in Lechuguilla, discovering that they were important agents in the biochemical breakdown of carbonate rocks. Michael Queen studied the speleogenesis of flank margin caves on Bermuda for his PhD dissertation. These caves were formed in zones where fresh and seawater is mixed, forming an aggressive solution that dissolves limestone. Michael brought this background to his studies of Guadalupe caves, reasoning that the solution of large passages and galleries was a mixing zone phenomenon. Michael was also interested in the process of condensation corrosion and its relation to airflow in caves. He recognized air circulation cells in Carlsbad and Lechuguilla and described dissolution and depositional speleogenic passage modifications caused by carbonic acid transported by airflow. Dave Decker came to the University of New Mexico to work on a PhD, and with his caving background, he wanted a dissertation topic related to caves. He worked with Victor Pollock and Yamani Asmaram, 
and together they tackle the mystery of the strange rooms lined with giant calcite crystals that are encountered in Lechuguilla and elsewhere in the Guadalupes. Dave figured out that these passages were much older than most of Lechuguilla, having been formed many millions of years earlier and by a speleogenetic process previously unrecognized. Dave learned that carbon dioxide can exist at a supercritical state under just the right temperature and pressure conditions. This carbon dioxide is neither a liquid nor a gas, but has properties of both and is capable of dissolving large quantities of limestone. He also learned that a slight reduction in the pressure temperature conditions will allow that carbon dioxide to precipitate its load of calcite on the walls of those same voids, forming huge geodes. At least one of these geodes was intersected by Lechuguilla, and we know it as Spar City. In 1990, Kim Cunningham posed an idea to me, Harvey Duchesne, regarding a formal geological and mineralogical inventory program for Lechuguilla. Kim knew that the cave contained extraordinary deposits of rare speleogenetic minerals and a fabulous array of speleothems. However, nobody knew how rare or common these things are or where they had been found in the cave. Kim and I worked out a proposal for Ron Kerbo describing the project and pointing out that it would be a valuable tool for managing the cave. Kerbo approved of the plan and helped secure funding and support. I trained and managed a team of 40 plus cavers who collected data throughout Lechuguilla. We studied fossils and other features displayed along the geology trail in Guadalupe Mountains National Park and I taught them how to recognize those features in Lechuguilla. As it turns out, Lechuguilla is a fabulous place to see fossils, reef textures, speleogenetic features and speleothems related to sulfuric acid speleogenesis. This is because it has never been subject to mechanical erosion. Features etched in relief by condensation corrosion are beautifully displayed. All the evidence is there. The trick is in recognizing it. Originally, the project was to focus on minerals, but I realized that this was a chance to look closely at everything Lechuguilla has to offer. So I expanded the inventory list to 148 parameters, covering minerals, speleothems, speleogens, paleontology, and water. The project ran for eight years and data was collected at more than 5,000 survey stations. Data from the cave could be selected and displayed with air photos, topographic maps, and any other digital data. The inventory project resulted in publications on the mineralogy, paleontology, and the speleogenetic history of Lechuguilla and the Guadalupe Mountains. Paul Berger is more than a cave specialist at Carlsbad Caverns National Park. He is also a cave scientist who became interested in how stratigraphic and structural geologic features of the Capitan Reef Complex impacted the development of Lechuguilla. He correlated cave passage with surface liniments using ArcGIS softwares to make analytical studies. Paul identified features like fault and breccia pipes exposed in the walls of Lechuguilla and connected them to the development of the cave. Somehow, Paul finds time to continue his Lechuguilla exploration, mapping, and science studies while working for the National Park Service in Anchorage, Alaska. Max Fischer and Hazel Barton discovered blue barite crystals in a pool near Blancanabi Dodd Hall while doing cleanup survey and remapping of the area. The discovery of the blue crystals prompted a more thorough study of barite occurrences throughout Lechuguilla. Hazel, a professor at Akron University in Ohio, is interested in deep subsurface cave environments and could be described as a geomicrobiologist, among other things. Max is a research scientist at the Department of Marine Research at the Senckenberg Research Institute in Wilhelmshaven, Germany. Both are superb cave surveyors and cartographers, as well as exceptional scientists. Max and Hazel collaborated with Katie Bender, a graduate student at Akron, to describe barite occurrences in Lechuguilla. Using scanning electron microscopy, they found tracks in the surface of some barite crystals, suggesting that microbes might have played a role in the precipitation of the mineral. 
A summary overview paper on barite speleothems in Lechugia was published in the International Journal of Speleology in 2019. Max and Hazel are working on an expanded study that will examine all known barite and celestite occurrences in Lechugia. Many people have contributed to science studies in Lechugia. In this presentation, I tried to focus on the people who made geologic discoveries, but there are others who studied water chemistry, microbiology, radiometric age dating, and other topics. One of the most interesting things to come out of the scientific studies in Lechugia is the blurring of the boundaries between sciences. Lechugia has taught us that things we once thought were purely geological or biological or chemical are actually caused by combinations of all three agents. I don't know where scientific research in the next 150 miles of Lechugia will lead us, but I am certain that there will be new discoveries. The torch has been passed to a younger group of enthusiastic scientists with new ideas and new approaches. They will build on the work done by the last generation and science will move forward. I thank you all for listening.